Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, and thanks for the introduction. At this point in time, I think it's safe to say that we have really no problem thinking about genes when we think about sports ability. Uh, the cele celebrated Manning family is a, a well-known case in point. They seem to be winning Super Bowls all the time, and it seems to be one big family reunion every time it happens. By contrast, we're a little uneasy about other traits, ascribing genetic influences to other traits, such as intelligence or personality. And I'd like to explore a little bit why, why that is and um, propose to you a solution to the problems that that um, issue represents. So, of course, I'm speaking, as you just heard in the introduction, about the age-old nature-nurture controversy. Nature versus nurture. Genes versus the environment. The idea that it can be either genes or the environment. All or nothing. Long-term, very highly polarized debate. Uh, apples and oranges kind of situation. Today, I want to tell you a little story about how I've used honeybees and the new science of genomics to provide a solution to this age-old problem. So we start with honeybees. Uh, my laboratory studies honeybees. One of the reasons that we use honeybees for our studies of understanding the roots of social behavior is that we can conduct massive social engineering experiments uh, on a grand scale um, in the form that you see right here. Each of these white boxes is a beehive. It's a society. It's a large family, anywhere between 50 to 100,000 individuals. And we can manipulate these societies. We can make big societies, little societies, genetically diverse, genetically narrow, hungry, well-fed. We can treat them with neuroactive substances. And we can do this on a highly replicated way. As you can see, each of these beehives we have here at the University of Illinois, about 100 beehives scattered around the countryside. So we can replicate our experiments in highly precise ways and then look at the effects. That is, we can change the social environment, change the genetic composition of the society, and look at the effects on the behavior of the individuals, on the brain of the individuals, and on the genes inside the brain of the individuals. So my laboratory uses this approach, then, to understand the roots of social behavior, uh, the behavior of the individuals and its brain, and then the genes, how genes influence social behavior, and what this tells us about the nature-nurture controversy. The major research system that we study is indicated in this slide here. Um, like any good society or any good corporate entity, the Honeybee Society has a division of labor. Different individuals perform different activities. Basically, the division is as follows. Some individuals work inside the hive, taking care of the baby bees, building the structure, processing the food, taking care of all sorts of activities there. And then the older bees are out on flowers collecting the food for the rest of the society. So when bees are young, they work inside the hive. They spend the first two and a half to three weeks working inside the hive. And then they sort of graduate and become a forager and then go outside and collect food. So the age at which they make this transition from working in the hive to becoming a forager is the behavior that we're going to be talking about today. And where I want to lead you is to tell you that we have found that this behavior is socially regulated. This timing of when a bee grows up and becomes a forager is socially regulated. And this social regulation manifests itself in changes in the activity of literally thousands of genes at the time the transition is made. And it's those insights that I then use to give a solution to the nature-nurture problem. So that's where we're going. So work in the hive, then they graduate and become a forager. And the question is, how do they know uh, what to do, when to create this change, when to make this change? So when you remove all the old bees, bees in a society, some of the young ones will grow up prematurely and become precocious foragers. That's one of our main experimental techniques. And it corresponds to the situation in nature. When a calamity befalls a colony, all the foragers are killed. Some of the young ones will speed up and become precocious foragers. This is equivalent, as the slide suggests, to um, if, uh, God forbid, some calamity befalls our society and everyone over 16 um, becomes, has to then become, uh, is, is lost, then individuals younger than 16 will become the drivers. And uh, having a son that's around that age, that's a very scary thought to think about. So how do the bees know? How do they know what to do? Well, in our society, 
If we want to know what to do, we rely upon centralized control. Some individuals collect information, they process the information, the information flows down the chain of command, and then individuals respond appropriately. That is, so this is an appropriate slide. May, people are getting ready to graduate. Some of the B-School students are getting, pardon the pun, getting ready to graduate. And so they want to know where the jobs are. Where do you go? Where do you go if you want to look for jobs? You read something like the Wall Street Journal, representing some centralized form of control. Not so for the B-Society. No one's in charge. The queen is present, of course, as you know, but she doesn't tell the workers what to do. If the queen were named now, at our point in time in society, she would not be named queen. She would probably be named something like, yo, egg-laying mama. Very little respect <laughs> accorded to her, because she doesn't really run the show. She lays the eggs. So it's the workers that decide what to do, but no one's in charge. The lights are on, but no one's home. How do they know what to do? They rely upon decentralized mechanisms, and we discovered one of the mechanisms in the context of regulating how fast the bees grow up. So what we discovered was a process of social inhibition. Old bees inhibit how fast the young bees grow up. You remove the old bees, you remove the inhibition, and then the young ones will grow up fast. We found that this form of inhibition involves a communication signal, a sharing of a chemical that's shared during the feeding that bees engage in in the colony. So some of you know that in primate societies, grooming is the big deal. It's the glue that binds individuals together. In insect societies, it's the sharing of food, the sharing of substances associated with food and the food itself. That's the glue that binds the society together and gives it some of the holistic properties that allow us to call it a superorganism and liken it to uh, an organism or a society. So we found that old bees inhibit how fast young bees grow up and that this process involves a, a exchange of, of food and, and other material. It sounds very straightforward, doesn't it? It sounds like we got up in the morning, designed an experiment to test the hypothesis and found this out. But I'm here to tell you today that that's not the way it went. Um, there was an accidental discovery that was involved in this process. So we were uh, busy studying precocious foraging, so we created colonies of bees that were all one day of age, because we knew, as I just told you before, that in a colony without old bees, some of the bees will grow up prematurely. So we knew that, and a postdoc working in my laboratory was busy studying that phenomenon, and this is represented in this slide here. So we can use, uh, I showed you honeybees in white boxes. In the laboratory, we can put them in special design situations where there's glass windows, so we can see exactly what they're doing. Honeybees are not shy. They don't change their behavior when they're being watched, and so we can really tune in and watch the behaviors. So postdoc in my lab was watching the individuals, seeing what might be some cues to the onset of precocious foraging. And at that point in time, we were under the illusion and under the assumption that we were looking for some changes in behavior that would accelerate the maturation. We were looking for a stimulation effect. Meanwhile, uh, a Hollywood film crew wanted to come and film some work in the lab, and they asked, uh, sh and they wanted to have a glass wall observation hive. And I said, well, we've got one right here. They said, no, no, it's too small. We need a bigger one. We need to set up another one. So we set up another one, and uh, the concern that we had was that it might be a little close to this one uh, here, and the concern was that some of the old bees here might accidentally go into this colony because the distance between them was less than what we like to have. So bees are incredibly smart creatures. They can do all sorts of things. They did not evolve under conditions this dense, and the fact is, if you promise not to share it with anyone else, some of them make a few mistakes here. And the worry was they might drift in to this colony. But hey, Hollywood comes to your lab once every few years. You never know. If they say to do something, you do it. So I asked, I asked um, my postdoc a, a couple of days later, well, how's the experiments going over here? What have you been seeing? And he said, well, actually, not so. Things didn't go so well. As we were worried, some of the bees drifted over from the big colony into the little colony. There's no precocious foraging in my colony. I can't do my experiment anymore. I, of course, felt guilty. The pursuit of, of vain glory uh, had screwed up an experiment. But uh, after I calmed down, I realized, you know, in science, there's really two ways to do something. Uh, there's two ways to study a phenomenon. One way is you study it as it naturally unfolds, and that's what we were trying to do. But another way to do it is to manipulate the process and break the process. And then, once you've broken the process, 
figure, it out, figure out what it is that you did to break that process. So we were under path A. We were studying the process very nicely, very carefully. We induced it. We wanted to study it. What we accidentally did here is we broke it. We, we blocked precocious foraging. And then we had to figure out how it is that we blocked it. Of course, our hypothesis was, just looking at what happened, was that it was the old bees drifting in to the young bee colony that interfered with the precocious foraging. But we couldn't stop there, obviously, because that's an anecdote. You kick the tires of your car, your radio goes on. Does that mean anything? No, there's a difference between correlation and causation. But we then used this to design experiments, which I won't show you today, to actually test the hypothesis that if you transplant old bees into a young bee colony, you can shut down precocious foraging. So we did the experiment on Q, not anecdotally. We did all sorts of different controls. We transplanted young bees. We manipulated when we did the transplant. And we found, clearly, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that it's old bees that inhibit the maturation of the young bees. So this leads me then to the second part of the talk, and that is to bring in the new science of genomics. So many of you are familiar with the, with the concept of the genome as a blueprint, the idea of a static set of instructions to build an organism. And that, of course, is part of the story of what the genome does. But new science that's emerging, especially from the area of behavior that I work in, shows that there's a whole other side to the genome, and that is the dynamic side of the genome. This slide here shows, um, first of all, just in words, the information that we've been gathering, the new insights that we've been gathering about how social information is able to affect the genome inside your brain, inside the brain cells that you have to change behavior. The background graphic indicates a technique that's been used to give us this insight. This technique is called the microarray. Each one of these dots represents a gene. We're now able to measure the activity of all the genes in the genome at the same time in particular scientific context, behavior in this particular case. And as the image indicates to you, we now see this kind of effect, that genes are turning on and turning off all the time. This is a dynamic process. So what we found in the case of the precocious foragers is that when bees are growing up, when they're working in the hive as nurses, and you compare the nurse bee behavior, those are the young bees that work inside the hive taking care of the babies, and you compare that to foragers, you see that 40% of the genes in the brain cells of the bees show changes in their activity, 40% between a nurse bee and a forager. Now, then we perform, when we perform our experiment and create precocious foragers, their brain activity profile looks exactly like a normal age forager, telling us that the social environment is getting under the skin. It's getting inside the brain of the bee. It's influencing its genomic activity. It's causing the genes to go on and off like Christmas bulbs here, Christmas lights, to change then the brain and the behavior. So what does this have to do with nature and nurture? Well, first, before I go on to that, I want to say that this insight that we've generated here at the University of Illinois with honeybees, we're also seeing um, across the, the country and other places for a variety of other organisms as well, in fish, in birds, in ants, in rodents. The dynamic genome is something that we're seeing more and more as we wed the study of genomics with the study of social behavior, uh, a new discipline that I have called sociogenomics. So what does this have to do then with the nature-nurture controversy? What it says is that the genome has two personalities, that nature and nurture are both acting on the genome. So I think this proverb, Spanish proverb, sums it up pretty well. The horns of a dilemma are usually on the same bull. In this case, the bull is the genome. So nature and nurture, terms that you're familiar with, heredity and environment, they both act on the genome. Nature acts on the genome via genetic influences on the genome. These are long-term effects that occur from generation to generation over evolutionary time. There will be changes in your genome, changes in the etchings of your DNA. 
the actual sequence of your DNA will change. That's nature. Nurture, now we understand to mean environmental effects that also affect the genome. Not changing the sequence, but changing the activity. Which genes turns on, turn on, which genes turn off, and when this occurs. So I'll just leave you with a final thought as we then confront the new realities of the genome, that it's a dynamic and not static entity, we then face a variety of very interesting questions such as this one. So you know we're moving into an era where DNA sequencing, genetic profiling is happening more and more. And the question I want to leave you with is, what is the relevance of that profiling of determining the actual sequence of an individual when we also now know that it's not just what the sequence is, but how active it is, which genes are turning on, which genes are turning off, and in what circumstances, and how potent the environment is in changing that activity. So it's a, a very exciting time to be in the area and studies of genomics as we contemplate how genomics is going to project on into the world and affect various sorts of policy decisions. Thank you very much. Thank you.